Chapter 12 of The Gods of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Gods of Mars. Chapter 12 Doom to Die. For an instant I stood there before they fell upon me, but the first rush of them forced me back a step or two. My foot felt for the floor, but found only empty space. I had backed into the pit which had received Issus. For a second I toppled there upon the brink. Then I, too, with the boy still tightly clutched in my arms, pitched backward into the black abyss. We struck a polished chute. The opening above us closed as magically as it had opened, and we shot down, unharmed, into a dimly lighted apartment far below the arena. As I rose to my feet, the first thing I saw was the malignant countenance of Issus glaring at me through the heavy bars of a grated door at one side of the chamber. "'Rash mortal!' she shrilled. "'You shall pay the awful penalty for your blasphemy in this secret cell. Here you shall lie alone and in darkness, with the carcass of your accomplice festering in its rottenness by your side, until crazed by loneliness and hunger you feed upon the crawling maggots that were once a man." That was all. In another instant she was gone, and the dim light which had filled the cell faded into Sumerian blackness. "'Pleasant old lady,' said a voice at my side. "'Who speaks?' I asked. "'Tis I, your companion, who has had the honor this day of fighting shoulder to shoulder with the greatest warrior that ever wore metal upon Barsoom. "'I thank God that you were not dead,' I said. "'I feared for that nasty cut upon your head.' "'It but stunned me,' he replied. "'A mere scratch.' "'Maybe it were as well had it been final,' I said. We seem to be in a pretty fix here with a splendid chance of dying of starvation and thirst. Where are we? Beneath the arena, I replied. We tumbled down the shaft that swallowed Issus as she was almost at our mercy. He laughed a low laugh of pleasure and relief, and then, reaching out through the inky blackness, he sought my shoulder and pulled my ear close to his mouth. Nothing could be better, he whispered. There are secrets within the secrets of Issus of which Issus herself does not dream. What do you mean? I labored with the other slaves a year since in the remodeling of these subterranean galleries, and at that time we found below these an ancient system of corridors and chambers that had been sealed up for ages. The blacks in charge of the work explored them, taking several of us along to do whatever work there might be occasion for. I know the entire system perfectly. There are miles of corridors honeycombing the ground beneath the gardens and the temple itself, and there is one passage that leads down to and connects with the lower regions that open on the water shaft that gives passage to Omin. If we can reach the submarine undetected, we may yet make the sea in which there are many islands where the blacks never go. There we may live for a time and who knows what may transpire to aid us to escape." He had spoken all in a low whisper, evidently fearing spying ears even here, and so I answered him in the same subdued tone. "'Lead back to Shador, my friend,' I whispered. "'Zodar the Black is there. We were to attempt our escape together, so I cannot desert him.' "'No,' said the boy, "'one cannot desert a friend.' It were better to be recaptured ourselves than that. Then he commenced groping his way about the floor of the dark chamber, searching for the trap that led to the corridors beneath. At length he summoned me by a low, st, and I crept toward the sound of his voice to find him kneeling on the brink of an opening in the floor. There is a drop here of about ten feet, he whispered. Hang by your hands and you will alight safely on a level floor of soft sand. Very quietly I lowered myself from the inky cell above into the inky pit below. So utterly dark was it that we could not see our hands at an inch from our noses. Never, I think, have I known such complete absence of light as existed in the pits of Issus. For an instant I hung in mid-air. There is a strange sensation connected with an experience of that nature 
which is quite difficult to describe. When the feet tread empty air, and the distance below is shrouded in darkness, there is a feeling akin to panic at the thought of releasing the hold and taking the plunge into unknown depths. Although the boy had told me that it was but ten feet to the floor below, I experienced the same thrills as though I were hanging above a bottomless pit. Then I released my hold and dropped, four feet to a soft cushion of sand. The boy followed me. "'Raise me to your shoulders,' he said, "'and I will replace the trap.' This done, he took me by the hand, leading me very slowly, with much feeling about and frequent halts to assure himself that he did not stray into wrong passageways. Presently we commenced the descent of a very steep incline. "'It will not be long,' he said, "'before we shall have light. At the lower levels we meet the same strata of phosphorescent rock that illuminates Omin. Never shall I forget that trip through the pits of Issus. While it was devoid of important incidents, yet it was filled for me with a strange charm of excitement and adventure, which I think I must have hinged principally on the unguessable antiquity of these long-forgotten corridors. The things which the Stygian darkness hid from my objective eye could not have been half so wonderful as the pictures which my imagination wrought, as it conjured to life again the ancient peoples of this dying world, and set them once more to the labors, the intrigues, the mysteries and the cruelties which they had practiced to make their last stand against the swarming hordes of the dead sea-bottoms that had driven them step by step to the uttermost pinnacle of the world, where they were now entrenched behind an impenetrable barrier of superstition. In addition to the green men there had been three principal races upon Barsoom, the blacks, the whites, and a race of yellow men. As the waters of the planet dried and the seas receded, all other resources dwindled until life upon the planet became a constant battle for survival. The various races had made war upon one another for ages, and the three higher types had easily bested the green savages of the water places of the world. But now that the receding seas necessitated constant abandonment of their fortified cities, and forced upon them a more or less nomadic life in which they became separated into smaller communities, they soon fell prey to the fierce hordes of green men. The result was a partial amalgamation of the blacks, whites, and yellows, the result of which is shown in the present splendid race of red men. I had always supposed that all traces of the original races had disappeared from the face of Mars, yet within the past four days I had found both whites and blacks in great multitudes. Could it be possible that in some far-off corner of the planet there still existed a remnant of the ancient race of yellow men? My reveries were broken in upon by a low exclamation from the boy. At last, the lighted way, he cried, and looking up, I beheld at a long distance before us a dim radiance. As we advanced, the light increased until presently we emerged into well-lighted passageways. From then on, our progress was rapid, until we came suddenly to the end of a corridor that led directly upon the ledge surrounding the pool of the submarine. The craft lay at her moorings with uncovered hatch. Raising his finger to his lips and then tapping his sword in a significant manner, the youth crept noiselessly toward the vessel. I was close at his heels. Silently we dropped to the deserted deck, and on hands and knees crawled toward the hatchway. A stealthy glance below revealed no guard in sight, and so, with the quickness and the soundlessness of cats, we dropped together into the main cabin of the submarine. Even here was no sign of life. Quickly we covered and secured the hatch. Then the boy stepped into the pilot house, touched a button, and the boat sank amid swirling waters toward the bottom of the shaft. Even then there was no scurrying of feet as we had expected, and while the boy remained to direct the boat I slid from the cabin to cabin in futile search for some member of the crew. The craft was entirely deserted. Such good fortune seemed almost unbelievable. When I returned to the pilot house to report the good news to my companion, he handed me a paper. 
This may explain the absence of the crew, he said. It was a radio aerial message to the commander of the submarine. The slaves have risen. Come with what men you have and those that you can gather on the way. Too late to gain aid from Omin. They are massacring all within the amphitheater. Issus is threatened. Haste. Zithad. Zithad is Dator of the guards of Issus, explained the youth. We gave them a bad scare, one that they will not soon forget. Let us hope that it is but the beginning of the end of Issus, I said. Only our first ancestor knows, he replied. We reached the submarine pool in Omin without incident. Here we debated the wisdom of sinking the craft before leaving her, but finally decided that it would add nothing to our chances for escape. There were plenty of blacks on Omin to thwart us were we apprehended. However, many more might come from the temples and gardens of Issus would not in any decrease our chances. We were now in a quandary as how to pass the guards who patrol the island about the pool. At last I hit upon a plan. "'What is the name or title of the officer in charge of these guards?' I asked the boy. "'A fellow named Torith was on duty when we entered this morning,' he replied. "'Good. And what is the name of the commander of the submarine?' Yersted. I found a dispatch blank in the cabin and wrote the following order. Dator Torith, return these two slaves at once to Shador, Yerstead. That will be a simpler way to return, I said, smiling, as I handed the forged order to the boy. Come, we shall see now how well it works. But our swords, he exclaimed, what shall we say to explain them? Since we cannot explain them, we shall have to leave them behind us, I replied. Is it not the extreme of rashness to thus put ourselves again, unarmed, in the power of the firstborn? It is the only way, I answered. You may trust me to find a way out of the prison of Shador, and I think, once out, that we shall find no great difficulty in arming ourselves once more in a country which abounds so plentifully in armed men. As you say, he replied with a smile and shrug. I could not follow another leader who inspired greater confidence than you. Come, let us put your ruse to the test. Boldly we emerged from the hatchway of the craft, leaving our swords behind us, and strode to the main exit which led to the sentry's post and the office of the Dator of the Guard. At sight of us the members of the Guard sprang forward in surprise, and with leveled rifles halted us. I held out the message to one of them. He took it, and seeing to whom it was addressed, turned and handed it to Torith, who was emerging from his office to learn the cause of the commotion. The black read the order, and for a moment eyed us with evident suspicion. "'Where is Dator Yusted?' he asked, and my heart sank within me, as I cursed myself for a stupid fool in not having sunk the submarine to make good the lie that I must tell." His orders were to return immediately to the temple landing, I replied. Torith took a half-step toward the entrance to the pool as though to corroborate my story. For that instant everything hung in the balance, for had he done so and found the empty submarine still lying at her wharf, the whole weak fabric of my concoction would have tumbled about our heads. But evidently, he decided, the message must be genuine nor, indeed, was there any good reason to doubt it, since it would scarce have seemed credible to him that two slaves would voluntarily have given themselves into custody in any such manner as this. It was the very boldness of the plan which rendered it successful. "'Will you connected with the rising of the slaves?' asked Torith. "'We have just had meagre reports of some such event.' "'All were involved,' I replied but it amounted to little. The guards quickly overcame and killed the majority of us. He seemed satisfied with this reply. "'Take them to Shador,' he ordered, turning to one of his subordinates. We entered a small boat lying beside the island, and in a few minutes were disembarking upon Shador. Here we were returned to our respective cells, I with Sodar, the boy by himself.' 
and behind locked doors we were again prisoners of the firstborn. End of chapter 12